Um, I was asked to read 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is uh, where the Apostle Paul is teaching young pastor Timothy, and all elders really, how they are to do their work. That is, recognizing that the devil is involved in the lives of God's people. So we pick up the reading, 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Our speaker tonight is Professor Gritters. Professor was born and raised here in Redlands and is therefore a son of this congregation. He attended Calvin College and the Protestant Reformed Seminary. He sustained his synodical and classical exams and was ordained into the ministry in May of 1984. His first charge was Byron Center Protestant Reformed Church in Michigan. He served there for some 10 years until he accepted the call to Hudsonville PRC in 94. Reverend Gritters then shepherded the flock there until receiving the call to the Protestant Reform Seminary in 2003, approximately nine years later. The call to the seminary was accepted and he continues there as professor of theology yet today. Let us now give our attention to Professor Gritters, as he addresses us, and before I ask him to come up, I forgot one thing. There are cards in front of you in the pew for questions. We're going to have a question and answer period at the end. Um, please, during the lecture, write down any questions you have, as they are hard to remember right at the end. Um, and we will answer as many of those as we can at the end, time permitting. So now, the Prince of Darkness Grimm is the topic. Professor Gritters. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak tonight here. I'm very thankful for that invitation. Uh, some of you may know, some of you may not, but my father is seriously ill in the hospital, and I'm thankful for the providence of God that arrange this uh, speech here uh, this weekend so that my wife and I could see dad. Some of you asked me before the speech tonight whether had dad died I been able to give this speech and my answer was immediately yes and I'd given some thought to that and thought that had the Lord taken him this would be the way I would begin. For as much then as the children are the partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that is, Christ became like us, that through death Christ might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We're not afraid of death. The Lord Jesus Christ delivered us who were afraid of death by delivering us from the one who had death in his hands because now Christ has death in his hands and uses it for our good. But that's not how I began. Begin. Dad is doing well, I'm thankful to say. And we're here. Dad's at the hospital. A brother is sitting with him, and he's stable. But I believe that there's a devil, and you must believe that there's a devil, because the Bible teaches that there's a devil. It's interesting to see that 
even as the interest in the devil in the churches goes down, interest in the world among non-Christians seems to go up. It seems to me that the reason that the interest in the devil goes down in the churches is that the churches aren't teaching the Bible any longer. And the interest in the world among non-Christians goes up because there's all kinds of speculation as to what they know is real. I believe that there is a devil. You must believe that there is a devil. And we must believe that there is a devil because the Bible teaches that there is a devil. And the Bible teaches us a lot about the devil too. I had an interesting experience in the airport in Chicago yesterday. We had a miserable seven hour layover there, partly because Obama had flown through and mechanical problems too. And in the course of that stay, I met a young lady who asked what I was doing in my trip. I had asked her, what do you do when you're sitting seven hours in an airport waiting for your plane to leave? And when I told her that I was a seminary professor coming to California to give a speech, she asked what the speech was about. And I told her, and I asked her if she was a Christian. Well, of course she's a Christian, she said. Well, then, no, she said, I'm not really a Christian, but I do believe in God. Well, why do you believe in God? Hmm? Not sure why I believe in God. I guess because he's spoken to me. He's answered me when I've prayed. And do you believe in the devil? Do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in hell? Well, yes, this is hell, she said, here and now. I'm not sure what heaven is. And I tried to press her as to what was the basis for her belief in all of these things. And she really couldn't come up with any answer. We are here tonight because we believe the Bible. And the Bible is the only rule for us for what we believe and how we live, for faith and life. And the Bible teaches us that there is such a thing as the devil. But there's interest among non-Christians in the devil. You think of all of the television programs and the movies that have made millions and even billions of dollars. Speaking about the paranormal, extraterrestrial beings, all kinds of bizarre creatures that come from who knows where. Is it the 27th day? How long before Halloween? And how much of the United States economy is based on the purchases that people make in connection with Halloween? Which celebrates what? In large part. You think of the books, the Vampire series by Anne Rice, the Twilight series by Stephanie Meyer, and who hasn't heard of the Harry Potter series, which itself has sold almost a half a billion books. There is an interest in the devil and in spirits and in creatures that have their existence apart from this earth. But our in interest in this subject is not because there's a resurgent interest among non-Christians. Our interest is because the Bible teaches that there is a devil. Our interest is that the Bible teaches that the devil is an enemy of God's people. And we ought to be as interested in the devil as our grandparents or great-grandparents were in late December of 1941 were interested in who Japan was. We ought to be that interested in the devil. We're interested, but we're going to be sober tonight in our treatment of the subject. I don't want to be sensational. Sensationalism and speculation may have any place in a treatment of such an important subject. We must be sober. And even though you may ask questions that tempt me to be sensational or speculative, I'm going to guard myself against that very carefully this evening and limit my treatment to what the Bible itself teaches about the devil. In C.S. Lewis' unique treatment of the devil's M.O., his modus operandi, C.S. Lewis said, quote, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about devils. One is to disbelieve their existence. The other is to believe and feel an unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, that is devils, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist 
or a magician with the same delight. A materialist doesn't believe in devils, and a magician thinks about devils all of the time. We must be careful. And carefulness is dependence on the Bible, not my experience or yours. Not what I've heard about someone else or what you've heard from someone else. We are going to depend on the Bible. We're not going to ignore how the church viewed the devil in the past, but we're going to depend upon the Scripture. Sobriety, that is a dependence on the Bible, means in the second place that there are some intriguing questions that can't be answered because the Bible doesn't answer them. One man, when he talked about this subject, said, quote, when the sober Christian is finished, he will remain with more questions than certain definite answers. And then in the third place, in connection with the careful dependence on the Bible, there are other questions that the Bible may address, but have such a small place in the Bible's teaching that to address them with any urgency would not be sobriety, because the Bible doesn't address them that way either. The Prince of Darkness Grim, the biblical teaching of Satan, that phrase, the Prince of Darkness Grim, comes from an English translation of the hymn of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was the man that God used in the early 16th century to bring about the reformation of the church. That's what we're celebrating in this time of the year that most of the world understands as Halloween. Martin Luther's hymn in the third stanza said, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness, grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Now Luther himself was somewhat sensationalistic when he spoke about the devil and somewhat speculative too. Luther said things like this, a Christian will know that he sits in the very midst of devils and that the devil is closer to him than his coat or shirt or even his skin. If anyone dies of the plague, is drowned or falls dead, this is the work of the devil. And I have some sympathy for Luther's wife because Luther also said, if I hear footsteps upstairs at night, I remember that it's just the devil and immediately I fall back to sleep. Luther was speculative when he spoke about the devil, but Luther was right in two respects. Number one, the devil is a grim foe. And number two, we battle the devil with the word of God. And that makes me say something I hadn't planned to say. I learned this summer in Germany when we traveled there to contact other saints of like faith that that old story of Luther throwing the inkwell at the devil. You've heard that story and even the old house that Luther lived in, they keep putting ink on a wall so that the tourists can come and see where allegedly he threw that ink against the wall. Came from Luther's statement that he fought the devil with ink. But the ink that he fought the devil with was not an inkwell that he threw at the devil because he believed that the devil could be hurt by a bottle. But Luther was referring to the reality that he fought the devil with the word of God explained on paper, written with words by ink. Let's consider this subject tonight. The Prince of Darkness Grimm, the biblical teaching about Satan. What I want to do to begin tonight is present the briefest outline of the Bible's teaching about the devil in relationship to the works and purposes of God most broadly. The works and purposes of God most broadly and then fit the Bible's teaching about the devil in that framework because of prominence and priorities. I say prominence because the devil gives, uh, the Bible gives the devil a prominence that might surprise you if you don't study the Bible carefully. You can't read the Bible without getting a sense that knowing the devil for us is as important as it was for our great-grandparents in 1941 to say, 
Who are the Japanese? And what are their weapons? And what must we be afraid of? The Bible gives the devil a prominence that make us sit up and pay attention. But also the Bible teaches us something about priorities. What's the most important issue here? What are the side issues? What has prominence and what doesn't have prominence? If I may use an illustration with regard to battle, am I going to spend my life studying anthrax? Knowing that anthrax is a real danger when 99% of people are getting killed by roadside bombs? Am I going to spend my time building a bomb shelter when most of my friends are being killed by snipers and I must learn to stay out of lines of fire? Will I be like a soldier who, watching the Japanese planes bomb Pearl Harbor, say, I think I need to brush up on my hand-to-hand -hand combat? And all of those would be mistakes that we don't want to make in connection with the subject of the devil, who is a grim foe of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's see God's purposes in their broadest perspective and reality and fit the teaching of the Bible of the devil in them. And then we'll understand something about priorities. From the very beginning of the Bible to the very end of the Bible, the devil has a place of prominence. The Bible opens up with a story, a true story, about the devil's place in God's works. He tempted Adam and Eve. Genesis 3 identifies the tempter as the snake. The rest of the Bible teaches that that serpent was the devil himself. Revelation 12 verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. The Bible opens up with history that involves the devil, and the Bible closes in the book of Revelation with symbolic teaching that shows the outcome of the great battle between the kingdom of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of Satan. And in between the beginning pages of the Bible and the end, the Bible is full of instruction regarding the devil. We're going to see that at the very beginning when the devil tempted Adam and Eve and they fell, God pronounced a curse upon the serpent, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And in connection with that curse that he pronounced upon him, said, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. And that enmity, you need to know, goes deeper than the natural loathing that most women have for snakes. To speak too lightly. That enmity that God put between the devil and the woman, between the devil's seed and the woman's seed, goes far, far deeper than the natural fear that people have for slithering serpents. And that enmity that God put between those two seeds is manifested all throughout the Old Testament. You can't read the Old Testament without understanding that. But let's skip the Old Testament for a moment and come to the very opening words of, of the New Testament. Revelation 12 teaches us that when Jesus Christ was born, it was the devil that instigated Herod to bring about that infanticide in Bethlehem because he supposed that killing all of the babies there would destroy the seed of the woman, the Christ who had come. That enmity that God put between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent in the beginning showed itself immediately at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me point out a number of other places in the New Testament in Christ's ministry where that becomes clear. What was the very first activity of Christ's earthly ministry? He took the initiative by the power of the Holy Spirit to meet the devil himself and was tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. What was the first report of Jesus' disciples after they came back from their first preaching tour? Luke 10, 17 records that they came back saying that the devils were subject to them. Only three short years after Jesus' ministry began, his public ministry ended. How? 
when Satan entered the heart of one of his disciples to betray Jesus to the Pharisees. When Jesus' resurrection took place, it's described in terms of his victory over, and I read Hebrews 2, verse 14, the devil. When Jesus ascended into heaven, what does Revelation 12 teaches us, teach us take, took place there? The casting down of Satan out of heaven, and then the warning that came to the inhabitants of the earth to beware because of the devil's great rage. When Christ commissioned his apostles, <clears throat> excuse me, I think my voice is going to clear up in a moment. It has. When Christ commissioned his disciples, he did that in these terms. And now a number of passages. Go to the Gentiles to turn their eyes from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. He warned those preachers that they would be opposed by, quote, the God of this world, and that's a reference to Satan, who, quote, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, so that the light of the gospel will not shine to them. That's 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. And then think of all of the New Testament warnings to the Christians of our age with regard to the devil. You can almost hear the urgency in the apostle's voice when he makes these warnings. The devil has servants who are his ministers who do what Satan himself did, transform themselves into ministers of light. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 15. The church must not let Satan take advantage of her. And Paul assumes that the church is not ignorant of the devil's devices. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11. You mustn't give place to the devil. Ephesians 4 26. You must stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6 verse 11. Elders may not be chosen who are new to the Christian faith because they'll fall into the condemnation of the devil. Pride. In the last days, the church must be aware that many will, quote, depart from the faith because they listen to seducing spirits and adopted doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you, James says to the church in chapter 4, verse 7. Be sober, be vigilant, because the devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, Peter says at the very end of his first epistle. Be awake, be alert, the devil goes about trying to devour people. There is a devil, and the New Testament teaches that. But don't forget about the comfort that the New Testament gives to Christians too. In Romans 16, verse 20, the apostle says, God will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And if you reread that last book of the Bible, you hear one of the crescendos in that book in chapter 12. There was a loud voice saying, in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. There is comfort in the New Testament for the people of God. The Bible is full of teaching about the devil. So it's not surprising that the church in the past said so much about the devil, we might think that they had an unhealthy obsession with the devil. But now we learn they simply had their eyes on the scripture. On the reverse side of that handout, on the one side are Bible passages, on the other side are references from the confessions, of the church of the past, prayers of the church, and all kinds of other documents that the church has adopted officially that make repeated reference to the devil. They didn't have an unhealthy interest in the devil. They had their eye on the scriptures. The origin of the devil is a hard question, but it's not impossible to say some things about it. The origin of the devil. But first, because we're not philosophical or religious dualists. We don't believe that there are two independent and equally ultimate realities, the things of God and the things of the devil. That's the doctrine of the Manichaeists. 
We won't speculate here either, and especially not here. There are questions here that have been given pretty dogmatic answers to that we may do that because the Bible doesn't. But we will teach what we believe the Bible does say. The origin of the devil is not in God. God created angels. God created the devil as a good angel. When God created the angels, we don't know with certainty. Sometime during the creative works of God, God made a great host of angels, perhaps millions of angels. Revelation speaks of thousands and Ten thousands times ten thousands, literally myriads of myriads. Those angels are spiritual beings whose purpose is to be messengers of God and servants of His people. Read Hebrews 1 verse 14. Angels are not chubby little naked babies with cute wings to help them fly, shooting little arrows around in people's hearts. Angels are majestic, powerful, spiritual beings, servants of God, messengers of His kingdom, and servants of us. Although they're invisible and spiritual, that is, they're not bound by the laws of space, they are able to work in space and affect the creation, as the book of Job teaches. But the Bible indicates mainly that their domain is the spiritual realm. They're not so interested in sending tornadoes to destroy property and children as they are interested in affecting things in men's and women's hearts. The Bible indicates mainly that their domain is the spiritual realm. He entered into Judas's heart. He provoked King David to number Israel, 1 Chronicles 21.1. He convinced Ananias in the early New Testament to lie. And he spoke to Jesus. But sometime after God created the angels and everything, and noted that everything that he had made was very good, one of the angels, now called Satan, fell and became corrupt. Because of his, the cause of his sin, according to 1 Timothy 3, 6, was pride. And you need to see that very carefully. The cause of the fall of Satan was pride. He wanted a place above the place that God gave him. He wanted a place above God. He wanted God's place instead of God. And that was the origin of the fall of Satan. Read Isaiah chapter 14. His position under God was not sufficient for him. He wanted a place over God. And in that chapter, Isaiah 14, the only place that Satan is called Lucifer, there is described that reality in figurative language. He wanted his throne to be exalted above the stars of God. The angel that God created good corrupted himself and became a powerful being opposed to God. And that's why his name is Satan, because Satan means adversary and opponent. He's also called the devil. That comes from the word from which we get our word diabolical. But that word means liar. And we'll see why he's called liar another time. He is the opponent, the Satan of God. Now along with Satan, the chief devil, a great number of other angels fell. We don't know their exact number, but Revelation 12 speaks of the dragon's tail taking a third of the stars of heaven with him. So if there are millions and millions of angels and a third of them became devils by their fall, there are many, many devils under their chief and head, Satan. These are the demons, or evil spirits, who with Satan, their chief, are busy working their works in the world. Revelation 12, 9 calls them his angels. Ephesians 2 calls them rulers of this age. 
thrones and dominions and principalities and powers and spiritual rulers in high places. Mark 5 calls them legions. Legions. The demoniac had legions of devils in him. The origin of the devil is not in God, but in his own fall from the place, the good place that God gave him. The devil's main purpose must be asked now. What is the devil's main purpose? What are the devil's works? What's his main purpose and what are his subordinate purposes? His aim, as the name Satan indicates, and as I said already, is to oppose God by establishing God's kingdom as his kingdom. By changing the kingdom of God into the kingdom of man and Satan. That's his main goal. He has kingdom purposes. God had a great purpose in the world and has a great purpose and aim to establish a kingdom for his own glory. God determined from eternity to put his own son on the throne and to people that kingdom with a great throng of citizens, his own elect, blood bought by the blood of his own son, all of whom around that throne of his son would give glory to him as the God and Father of all. You understand that to be the Bible's teaching. You can't read the scripture without seeing that, that the purpose of God's kingdom is that it is filled with people who give glory to him. Read the Christian book of worship, the book of Psalms, and see that. Give to the, glory, to the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. And then the people respond to that by saying, Not unto us, O Lord of heaven, but unto thee be glory given. They understand the purpose of their place in the kingdom to give glory to the great God in heaven. Now the devil, as the adversary of God and the opponent of God, says, No, the glory is not going to go to him. The glory is going to go to me. The devil doesn't want, you see, a, another kingdom alongside of God's kingdom. He doesn't want a rival kingdom. He wants God's kingdom. And he wants to claim that kingdom as his own. And he wants the worship of all of those who ought to be worshiping God to be given to him. That's the purpose of the devil. That's how you understand these passages in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He said to Eve, you can be like God. You must follow me. According to Isaiah, the devil's original sin was that attempt to supplant God. Quote, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's Lucifer speaking. When he tempted Jesus, he was bolder than what he said to Eve. He said to Jesus, bow down to me. Take my side and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world for your glory. As long as as you give your glory to me. He didn't want a kingdom alongside of God's kingdom. He wanted God's kingdom. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 prophesies that very, very clearly, that when the Antichrist comes, and the Antichrist is moved by the devil himself, he, quote, opposes God and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, Worship is the issue, remember. So that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's going to be his claim. I am God. Worship me. He wants God's kingdom for his own kingdom. And that's why Revelation 13 verses 4 through 8 describes the culmination of the devil's goals. 
quote, and they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who's like the beast? That's what we're supposed to say about God. Who is like unto God? Read Isaiah. But they say, who's like unto the beast? They worship, they bow down, they paid honor to the devil himself. And really that's the issue of the whole book of Revelation. The Bible begins with that issue. Who will be worshipped? And the Bible ends asking that question. Who will be worshipped as God? The devil or God himself? So the devil has cosmic goals. He has a worldwide purpose. He has a universal aim. And think universe. He wants the whole universe for himself. Think of Hitler to help understand this. Hitler began, at least in the minds of the people around him, with little goals. And he gained people on his side. But really, in the back of his mind, he had worldwide goals. He used people. He destroyed people. He gained a gathering of people. But he would stop at nothing than conquering the whole world. That's the devil. He'll destroy some people, he'll gain other people to his side, but in the end, his goal is very real. He wants everything, everything. We need to see his grand plan. We're not going to lose sight of the work that the devil does in individuals, but we need to see his grand plan. And when we look in the work that he does in individuals, we must not forget that he has this cosmic aim and universal purpose. He wants to destroy the kingdom of God. I think at this time it's possible to come to some preliminary conclusions. Let me list six preliminary conclusions just to provoke some thought. Number one, it would be a mistake to suppose that the devil was busy in the time of Jesus, but isn't now. Number two, it would be selfish to suppose that if the devil is not bothering me personally, I don't need to bother my head about the devil. Number three, it would be to trivialize matters to suppose that the devil has a great interest in turning pictures 90 degrees on the wall overnight and to draw strange symbols in the steam on the bathroom mirror or cause odd, odd thumps in the middle of the night to wake up people for who knows what reason. That's to trivialize matters. Number four, it would be a tragedy to identify the affliction of the man in Mark 5 as mental illness. Number five, it would be tunnel vision to conclude that the devil has only interest in you as believers and not in the lives of unbelievers. He has a kingdom to establish. He wants to enlist everyone on his side. He has work to do to destroy you and to gain everyone that he can to serve his purposes. He works now in the children of disobedience. Ephesians 2 verse 2. And number six, it would be folly to suppose that any attack on God's kingdom, God's cause, and God's glory is not truly devilish. It is. It's devilish. So we've looked at the Bible's teaching that there is such a thing as the devil. Gives it prominent place. Gives him prominent place. We've asked the question of the devil's origin. We've looked at the devil's main purpose, and we've come to some preliminary conclusions. Now, with time permitting, let's ask. The question with regard to the devil's ways and means and methods. The devil's ways and means and methods. And to answer that question, there's one important doctrine that stands really at the heart of the matter. And that is that the, the devil has legal right from a certain perspective to the worlds. The devil has legal right to claim what he seeks to own and control. Now that's a bold statement understanding our view and the Bible's teaching of the sovereignty of God. But let me explain what I mean there. You ponder this, you search the scripture, and you see whether these things are true. 
When the devil succeeded in tempting Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to sin against God, disobeying his commandments, and it all starts there, doesn't it? That's, that's real history, is it? isn't it? The devil tempted Adam and Eve to sin against God. That's real history. When the devil did that, I continue, man became guilty and subject to God's punishment that God had warned them of. The day you eat, you die. At that point, Adam and Eve took the devil's side and handed over everything that they were responsible for to him. Even the whole human race that was in their loins, as the Bible describes it. And by that, the devil gained the right to the earthly creation and to the human race. I think that's the only way you can understand this next list of scripture passages. Beginning with Romans 8 that speaks of the creation being itself subject to vanity and bondage. And that that creation needs to be released from bondage and vanity. That's why in the temptations that the devil tempted Jesus with, he could offer Jesus what he did. All the kingdoms of this world, if you but bow down to me. And Jesus didn't say to him, you don't have the right to offer that to me. He answered him, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The devil was offering something that the devil had the right to give from a certain perspective. Throughout the, dev th throughout the Old Testament, the devil was accusing the brethren. That is, the devil had access to heaven, making the charge against the people of God who were there. You don't have any right to be here because your sins have not been paid for yet. And that's why in the end, the devil is overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The devil is overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That was the price paid to redeem humanity, and that was the price paid to redeem the earthly creation itself. The blood of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, which was a payment for sin, not that the devil required, but that God himself required of his own Son. That's what the whole Old Testament waited for. This is what broke the back of the devil and made him rage so. Christ paid the price. That's why 1 Corinthians 2 says what it does. None of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What didn't they know? The princes of this world that crucified Christ. That the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ on the altar of the cross would be the breaking of their own back. They didn't know that. They didn't understand that. That was the hidden wisdom of God. To pay the price to gain the right of the people of God to what they lost in paradise. And that's why Hebrews 2.14 says what it does. Christ became like us. So that through death he might destroy him that had the power over death. That is, the devil. The devil had the power, that is, the right, over death. And now Christ came to destroy that right that he had and to destroy him. Now don't the devil's ways and means become clear? He does what he can to establish his own kingdom. He does what he can to destroy God's kingdom. He doesn't want anyone to come to Christ. He wants all men to join his kingdom. And he seeks to gain them by lies and fraud. By lies and deceit. That's his M.O. That's his work always. So he's a murderer. John 8, 44 calls him a murderer. Not physically, though he delights in death. Physical death, he does. But he's a murderer of people spiritually. Because to live apart from God is death. That's what we sing. That's what we've learned since we were young. To live apart from God is death. Tis good to seek his face. And the devil knows that. So he tries to murder people spiritually. He keeps men from coming to God. And he promotes men living lives that can be described as a continual death. 
And you know how he accomplishes that murder? By lying. By lying. He's the father of lies. John 8, verse 44. Now you need to listen carefully and compare the devil's purposes and M.O. with God's purposes and M.O. The mode of operation of God himself is mimicked by the M.O. of the devil. You see, God ap accomplishes his purpose through his word. We don't have time tonight to make reference to all those passages, but think about what the scripture says about the word of truth. Jesus prayed about his people, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Romans 1.17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. John 8.32 teaches, know the truth and the truth shall set you free. What liberates the child of God so that he's truly free? It's the word of God preached and taught from the pulpit and in the catechism room so that the people of God say, that word is more precious to me than thousands of silver and gold. And the devil notices that. So the devil sets up his shop and does the very same thing, except now the devil is lying. But the devil has his church. Those are the false churches. The devil has his teachers. Those are the false prophets. The devil has his words, and the words the devil speaks through those false prophets are all lies. Lies, lies, and damnable lies. He apes God, though. You see, the church has always talked about the devil as an ape of God. He sees what God does, and he mimics what God does because he wants what God has. But he lies. He lies about God. He lies about creation. He lies about what God did and how God did it. That's why we may say, rightly, evolutionism is devilish. You mustn't be embarrassed about saying that. Evolutionism is devilish. It's the lie. He lies about God's son. Who is he? Who was he? What did he do? He lies about the way into God's favor. You can go into God's favor by his son, but you have all these other paths into God's favor also. He lies about other religions. They're all acceptable. He lies about God's created order and marriage and family. He lies, and he's always lying. And he even comes into the church to chip away at the book of truth by making you suppose that it might not all be the word of God that it might actually have its origin in man. That you might be able to read these words and find the Word of God, but these words aren't the Word of God, and all kinds of other nonsense about the truth, which is God's means preached to save you. He lies, and he lies, and he lies, and he's always saying what he said to Eve in the garden. Did God really say that? Yea, hath God said Someone once said that the first casualty of war is the truth. And that couldn't be more apropos than with regard to this great war. The first casualty of war is the truth. False teaching is devilish. You read 2 Corinthians when Paul warns about Satan's ministers masquerading as ministers of righteousness... He was concerned about that because Satan's ministers are teaching the lie. So very practically, how does he attack the truth and promote the lie? How do the enemies of the church assault the church? Let me list a couple of examples and you read the scripture to confirm this on your own. In the first place, he infiltrates the church with liars. Those are the false prophets. Those are the wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible warns about that more than a few times. Of course he works in unbelievers. It's the unbelievers that he brings into the church or raises up as sons or daughters of the church that he uses to corrupt the church. He works in them. They're liars. They teach things other than the truth. Know this, Paul said in Acts 20, that after I depart, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. 
Even of your own selves men shall arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That's devilish. That's the way and the work of the devil. He infiltrates the church. That's his first work. He also uses institutions that oppose God and promote his lies. I think especially of colleges and universities today. They're engines of the devil's mindset in opposition to God. Try to survive in a, in a university being public about your faith with regard to Christ, creation, the order of marriage that God has laid down in the scriptures, the opposition to same-sex marriages and so forth. Try to survive in an, in a, in an institution like that, being public about your faith. It's not going to be easy. Those institutions often are engines of the devil's lies. I think of the entertainment industry, promoting the paranormal and parapsychology and I think of the fad today of being spiritual but not religious. That's what the girl at the airport said she was, spiritual but not religious. I didn't have the time to explain to her that being spiritual but not religious may well be the spirit of the devil in her. The devil, the devil works in institutions. In the third place, I believe that the devil does miracles to establish his lies. That's a controversial matter. I won't take the time this evening to try to prove that from the scripture, but I'm convinced that the Bible teaches that part of the deception of the devil is to establish his lies by miracles. To prove that what he says, prove on his terms that what he says is the truth, he performs miracles, great wonders, Wonders that are so deceptive that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. Read Matthew chapter 24. Those aren't illusions. Those aren't fake miracles. Some of the modern Bible translations translate 2 Thessalonians 2 that way. Fake wonders. But the Word of God teaches that just as Jannies and Jambres had the ability to turn their sticks into snakes... Jannies and Jambres were the opponents of Moses at the time of the ten plagues. Just as Jannies and Jambres had the ability to do real miracles, the Antichrist and the false church in the end will have that ability also. Why? To try to prove to you the word that he speaks, just as the Lord Jesus Christ proved to us the word he spoke, confirming that word by miracles. The devil does miracles to establish his lies. Fourth, in carrying out that course of his work, he is the master of deception. He uses smoke and mirrors. He is the master of subterfuge, red herrings, double dealings. He creates pretenses. He builds facades. And he does everything to distract your attention from his main purpose so that you suppose then what he's doing over here is his main purpose. It's the old rock in the bush over here so you can sneak and attack the enemy over there on the other side trick and ruse. Let's say he does have interest in drawing letters on a steamy mirror in the bathroom when you're taking a shower or turning a picture 90 degrees on the wall while you're sleeping or making odd thumps in your floor at night to wake you up. Let's suppose that he does do that and you believe that that's the devil. And you begin talking and maybe even writing articles and books about this proof that you have that the devil works. It's a ruse. It's a ruse. Who's interested in that? Well you are, of course, so that you're not interested in the main work that he's doing that's very, very important. And that is assaulting the hearts and the minds of the people of God. That's how I see him driving some insane to rant and rave against God. And I'm convinced he does. Some to be insane, to rant and rave against God so that all of our attention would be over there while he does his other main work to draw people away from God and the scripture. He works in some to brutalize a dozen children so that no one talks about the great vile sin of pornography and fornication that goes on in the world to make the world more money than any other industry does. That's the devil's work. 
All real works of the devil, but all to deceive men and turn their attention from his real work. Fifth, he acts as a spoiler, a wrecker. His policy is a scorched earth policy. He knows his time is short and his hatred of God is so vicious and severe, he's going to do anything that he can to wreck God's kingdom. It makes you think of a speared alligator that's now on a tether that's going to twist and turn and bite and do all the ruin that he can do in the last minutes of his life. That's the devil. That's the devil. He sows doubts in your hearts about your place in the kingdom. He erects marriages to damage God's children in those marriages. He creates division between friends in the church. He entraps this believer in pornography. He lures that man by alcohol, another by greed and possessions. He creates such busyness with television and even legitimate things to watch on television that we don't have time to do things that we ought to be doing. By one means or another, he robs us of time to carry out the primary responsibilities that we have in this life. Without denying your sinful nature, people of God, attribute everything that you can to the devil. He's real. He works. He's vicious. He hates God. And he hates you. Without denying the reality of your sinful nature, attribute many things to the devil. And sixth, and most importantly, he's preparing one man to become his greatest servant, to assume the place of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to call himself Christ and demand the worship that belongs only to Christ. He's the Antichrist, promised so often in the New Testament. Animated by the devil himself, that man will bring to culmination the century and millennium long opposition of the devil to God. He's going to culminate in his own kingdom, the anti-Christian kingdom. And when that anti-Christian kingdom has reached the culmination of its power, it's going to take aim at the little precious church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And is going to do what it can to throttle the church of Christ. He's going to change times and laws. The creation of God and the creation order of God is going to be completely turned upside down with regard to family and marriage and sex. That's going to be the kingdom of the Antichrist. That's the devil's work. That's what he wants to do so badly. Now I realize that you want to answer questions like, can the devil possess Christians? And that question almost jars you out of where we were, because where we were is the important place, the cosmic purpose that the devil has in the world. He wants God's kingdom, and he's going to do everything that he can to get God's kingdom. But in connection with that, there is a real question whether the devil is able to possess Christians. We don't have time to answer that now. Maybe in the question and answer, let me say very, very briefly that I'm certain that he has complete control over unbelievers. He does. They're in the bondage of Satan. It's another question whether he has the ability to give these unbelievers superhuman strength like the demon-possessed man had in Mark 5. That's another question. But there's no question whether he has complete control over their minds and wills. But the question is whether he has the ability to possess us. And I would like to submit to you tonight that that's the wrong question. That may be a question, but it's not the most important question. The most important question is this. Does he have the ability to influence you? Does he have the ability for a time in your life to ensnare you into certain sin so that you have to reread 2 Timothy 2 that was read before we began tonight? Elders, be aware that there may be members of the congregation who are ensnared by the devil who are trapped by the devil at the devil's will. And you must teach these members so that they can be recovered from that entrapment. 
Does the devil have the power to influence the people of God in such a way that in a certain area of their life and for a certain period of their life, he has control? And the answer is absolutely. That's what you need to be concerned about. And you mustn't be arguing about the question whether he has the ability to possess people today, believers or unbelievers. Just read the scripture as to what he has the ability to do. And you'll be busy enough not arguing, but fighting against him. And for the sake of people in the congregation who may be entrapped by the devil right now, that's the important business that we have. And then if you ask the question about exorcism, is there such a thing as exorcisms? Or read the Bible and find what the Bible says about exorcism. Who did them? There were Jewish exorcists. There must have been pagan exorcists. What does the Bible say in Ephesians 6 about the rite of exorcism? What instruction does the Bible give there in that passage about what you must do to exorcise a devil? What oath must you speak? It doesn't say anything about that. Nothing. It gives you a weapon to fight against the devil, and that's what we need to concentrate on. We need to be adept at wielding this sword of the Spirit to fight against the devil. And as to that matter of exorcism, you study that on your own. You ask some questions about that sometime. But again, that's not what you ought to be interested in. You ought to be interested in the battle against the devil with the Word. I want to leave you tonight with some comfort and a calling. The comfort is that there are good angels too. Think about that. And they that are on our side are more than they that are on the devil's side. And though John Milton's portrayal of them, to say nothing of Frank Peretti, is wrong. John Milton, you remember if you studied literature, as the angels uprooting trees and using them as great missiles against the devils. You mustn't get that impression as to what the angels do. They are good angels and they minister to you. They do. Who are heirs of salvation, just as they ministered to Christ after he was tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And don't fail to recognize those angels when they come. Some have entertained angels unawares. Second, the comfort is that the devil and all the evil angels are under the absolute sovereign control of God. Without God's will, they cannot so much as move. Lord's Day 10 of the Catechism. Read the book of Job and see what the devil was able to do apart from the permission of God and you will come up with the answer, absolutely nothing. He was as though he were on a tether and God allowed him to go so far and no farther. Remember, that's the reality in the world today. The devil is under the absolute sovereign control of God. Jesus has dominion over them now. Remember when the legion approached Jesus? How terrified they were of him? That's reality. If it was true with regard to the crucifixion of Christ, read Acts 2, read Acts 4. If it was true with regard to the crucifixion of Christ, that they did only what God before determined to be done in Christ's crucifixion, how much is that also not true for us? They do nothing more than what the will of God permits them to do with regard to our salvation, our salvation. The God of peace shall bruise Satan shortly under your feet. But there's a calling too, and that's what I end with tonight. There's a war, and you're in it, and the cause is the most important one that there could be. Here's your calling with regard to that war. Join the company of believers. This is the army. This is the army of God, the church. The Church of Jesus Christ. Christians aren't individualists. There's a rampant individualism in the world and that plays right into the hand of the, church, uh, of the devil. You join the church if you're not a member of the church. There's a reason that the church has said for 2,000 years outside of the church is no salvation. There's a reason why the apostle said what he did about excommunication in 1 Corinthians 5, that excommunication puts someone 
outside the church. What happens outside of the church? Their life is destroyed because that's where the devil reigns. Join and remain members of the church. Second, fight. Fight with all of your might and fight because you hate the cause of the devil and you love the cause of God. Fight. Don't watch. Don't allow others to fight for you. Don't say it's sufficient that we have elders and deacons and ministers and parents in the church. You fight and be busy in that fight. Adopt a warfare mentality. Adopt the mentality of warfare in which a ball game is the briefest diversion. The briefest diversion a ball game is for you so that you can get back to the most important calling you have in life and that is engaging in this life and death struggle against Satan and for the cause of God. Put on the armor of salvation that Ephesians 6 talks about and learn to wield the sword of the Spirit. And then hope and pray for the return of Christ who is the captain of your salvation. I didn't say sell all your possessions, put up billboards, and say that on October 21, 2013, perhaps, the Lord will return. And you who live in California know something about those kinds of callings and predictions. I didn't say that. I said, hope and pray for Christ's speedy return. When Christ will return and destroy all his enemies and all our enemies and give all glory to God. And when you see him coming, Christ coming, you're going to see him surrounded by all of the good angels, the holy angels. Those angels are going to remove from his kingdom all things that offend and do iniquity. Matthew 13, 41. Those holy angels are going to gather the elect scattered to the four winds of heaven. Matthew 24, 31. Because for all the history of the human race, those angels have been looking down into the things of God and with keenest interest have been observing what God's doing, rejoicing when every one of you came to faith and praying with us that the time would come soon when the Lord Jesus would come and establish His kingdom when He and His Father would be all in all. Believe that there's a devil. Fight against him. And live in faith that you are more than conquerors as you live in Christ. Thank you. I always think that question and answer periods are profitable. And I usually think of the right answer to the questions, but the right answer usually comes to me tomorrow morning. That's what I don't like about question and answer periods. Uh, there are some very nice questions. There are probably a dozen of them. I'm not sure we have time for all of them, but let's see what we can do. Doesn't the devil know that in the end he will be defeated? Why does he keep thinking to destroy the church then? Uh, keep working to destroy the church then? Well, I think that uh, I addressed that in the lecture when I said that the devil is a spoiler, a wrecker. Uh, he knows that he can't have God's kingdom. So the best he can do is to destroy God's kingdom. To do damage to the one that would not allow him to have the position that he wanted. That's how I read the scripture. The devil does know that in the end he will be defeated. The devil knows. You read the end of Re uh, Revelation chapter 12. The devil is cast down from heaven. He's on the earth. He knows he has but a little time. Therefore beware. Because he is going to thrash like a speared alligator on a, on a tether. Uh, this question also, does Satan know he cannot win? I believe he knows that. He's not om omniscient, but he knows that. The other question on this card asks, can Satan or his demons repent? I believe that when the New Testament speaks of elect angels... Elect angels, that means that the ones who are not elect are reprobate, and therefore they cannot repent. They don't want to repent, they won't repent, but they are reprobate angels. So I would say the answer to that question is no, on the basis of the scripture teaching that there are elect angels. And they can't fall away either because of God's election of them. 
In your opinion, does C.S. Lewis hold to heretical doctrines? Yes. Yep, he does. And uh, the more I understand of C.S. Lewis's theology, I, I believe that. However, that does not mean I don't believe that C.S. Lewis hasn't written some pretty nice things about the works of the devil, how the devil thinks and how sin works, the psychology of sin and our human nature. You can profit from reading uh, people who have some views that are heretical. Yep, read screw tape letters. You'll learn about yourself when you read the screw tape letters. If the devil is under God's sovereign control, how could he fall? That's a harder question, but I think it has this as the answer. Uh, here's the question. If the devil is under God's sovereign control, how could he fall? In the inscrutable wisdom of God, God determined not only the fall of the devil, he also determined the fall of Adam and Eve. That was in God's counsel. God's counsel determined that. All for the great glory of his own name through the sending of Christ to redeem us from our fallen position. But that's the teaching of the scripture. The absolute sovereignty of God even over sin. God does not make a man sin. God did not cause Adam and Eve to fall. God did not bring about the fall of the devil from his high position in heaven. But God did determine it. He did it. He did and he sovereignly controlled it too. And fitting those together is not the easiest thing to do. But read the scripture and you see that. I think of the one passage I talked about in First Chronicles 21. The interesting history when David sinned by counting his soldiers. God had told him not to count the soldiers. You're going to be lifted up in pride. Second Samuel 24. Now First Chronicles 21 verse 1 says, Satan provoked David to number Israel. Second Samuel 24 says, God moved David to number Israel. And at the end of Second Samuel 24 said, I did it. David said, I did it. I am at fault. He didn't blame God. He didn't blame the devil. He said, I sinned. And that's the scripture's testimony is the relationship between the sovereignty of God over sin, the place the devil has in that sin, and the reality that when at the end, we say we sinned. And I think that helps answer, yeah, it's the next question. When I, when I do evil deeds, whose fault is it? When I do evil deeds, whose fault is it? Um, mine. Mine. But I'm not going to forget that, that, I, that I have two my sinful nature that causes me to sin has two allies out there. And the Reformed Creed talks about that. We have three mortal enemies. The world is one, and that contributes to my sinning. The devil is another, and he contributes to my sin. And my sinful flesh is the third. So when I sin, whose fault is it? I would say mine and the devil's and the world's. And who stood at the foreground at this particular sin at this particular time? That's a matter of individuals and certain sins. Pentecostals seem to have put the devil on a pedestal. How does one show them otherwise? Well, it depends on what kind of pedestal you put them on. I want to put them on a pedestal too so that we can shoot them down. I want to give him the kind of prominence that the Bible gives him. That is, a place of great importance in God's plan and purposes. He's our greatest enemy. He's a great enemy. He's a grim foe. And we need to know his tactics. We're not ignorant of his devices, are we? Paul said in Corinthians, are we? Are we really ignorant of his devices? Paul spoke to the Corinthians and said, I assume that you're not. That is, you better not be ignorant of what the devil does. So. Yeah, let's put him up on a pedestal, not to worship him, not to pay attention only to him, but to recognize what place he has and how we need to fight against him. Um, maybe afterwards you can talk to me about how the Pentecostals really put the devil on a pedestal. I'm not sure that I know what you mean by that, but I'd be glad to, to speak to you afterwards. Two more. Uh, do you think Benny Hinn, for example, who claims to work miracles and heal, is actually given some power by the devil? 
I really don't uh, have a problem imagining that to be true. Uh, that may be offensive to you, but I am convinced that the devil has God-given ability to give men today ability to do miracles. Now, I'd first like to say, I would like those miracles confirmed. How many of those miracles, can, those miracles, I put in quotes, can be confirmed? Show me the people today that have been healed. And why isn't Benny Hinn going out to all the hospitals to heal? And why isn't he going to the gravesides to raise the dead? And why isn't he feeding people poison? And then, all right, you understand the point. I really wonder about these claims of miraculous power of Benny Hinn. But let's just suppose that you can show that he has actually done a miracle. I would say, don't look at what he does, listen to what he says. Because the Bible in Revelation 13 identifies the devil, the great dragon and the Antichrist, as someone who has horns like a lamb, that is, he appears to be Christ-like, but he speaks like a dragon. So I'm not interested in what Benny Hinn looks like or what he does. I'm interested in what Benny Hinn says. And if what he says harmonizes with the Word of God, then I believe it. And if not, I say he's a false prophet. Uh, in the back of that, does Satan know, understand, and read the Bible? I believe he knows, understands, and reads the Bible from a certain perspective better than most of us. He knows, he does, and he's learned. Um, I don't want to go too long, so let's take this last question. And they just came in the order that they were given to me. Regarding the devil and his works, do you perceive or view the modern church as passive in its vigilance against evil? What tactics can we Christians do to operate against the devil or use to operate against the devil? Do I perceive the modern church as passive? Yes, I do. I really do. And I think the reason is, as I said at the very beginning, the church isn't teaching the Bible anymore. They're, they're preaching all kinds of things, but they're not finding their sermons from the Scripture. And if they did, that they would, they would learn more about the devil and talk about the devil, as the church of the past did. So I'm not surprised if they're passive with regard to the devil. They think that's perhaps old-fashioned to talk about the devil. We mustn't think that that's old-fashioned at all. And the tactics we used to operate against the devil, the Word of God. The Word of God. One little word shall fell him. That's what we use. Preach and teach. Support your pastor. Support the pulpit. Support him as he teaches catechism. And then all of you, take the Word of God in your mouth and in your hand, and you go everywhere witnessing the truth. And that's what God is pleased to give to you as the weapon, the weapon against the devil. Appreciate the questions. Feel free, please, to uh, talk about it with me or others afterwards. And if you have other questions, you can submit them too. I think uh, Wayne said that you could possibly even answer some questions uh, on the church's website.